1986, I was a producer of wine. I owned a wine company called Rashi. Um, I produced wine all over the world and sold all over the world. One of the places which came to me, to which I had an opportunity to produce wine, at that point was Austria, in Vienna. I went to Vienna, I checked out the winery, and I found it perfect for what I needed. However, from before I made wine, I had to have the rabbi's consent, my mashkichum's. In this case, it was Rabbi Gavriel Zinner. When I came back to New York, the following week, on Sunday, I arranged that he should fly to Vienna to see, to give me, to see if he okay, to get his okay. On the way to the airport, we stopped off to get a dollar from the Rebbe. Mm -hmm. And the Rebbe gave the dollar to the Rabbi Sinner, and then Rabbi Sinner told him that he was going to Vienna to make wine. And the Rebbe said, are you going together? I had no intention of going back to Vienna at that point. Somehow or other, it got to him, and everybody started saying yes. And I, uh, I was taken aback. I, well, who's going where? I don't know. And the Rebbe gives me $13, $11 rather, at first. He gave me $2 afterwards. And he says, when you get to Vienna, you'll meet Rabbi Biederman. And you'll wish him before And uh, I wasn't taken, I was taken back because uh, the Rebbe never sent me anywhere. After I dropped off Rabbi Tzin at the airport, I came back to 770. I found Chaim Baruch Halberstam, who had the tapes. I went home, I saw the tape, yeah, it was real. Because till then I wasn't sure whether Rebbe was really talking to me, I wasn't. It never happened, you get shocked, shell shocked. And the Rebbe was told me, go to Vienna. <laughs> I, that when I get to Vienna, I should give, be involved, to get in touch with Rabbi Biedermann and give him this, the regards. Uh, I called Rabbi Biedermann, I asked him, did the Rebbe ever do this for you? Did you ever get regards or somebody ever bring anything to you from the Rebbe? He said, no. So I said, I told him I was just by the Rebbe and I have money for you and I'll be there tomorrow and I'll give it to you. Which I did. Next day, I flew out to Vienna, and I gave him his money. At that time, Vienna was getting a lot of publicity from the Jewish circles in particular. Kurt Waldheim, then the then uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, was being called back to, the, to Austria to become president of Austria. The Jewish world went against it, against him. And there was a lot of, there was a mess. Because here, the, the world, here, the Jews of the whole world were against uh, Waldheim becoming president in Austria. The, Austri the Austrians, on the other hand, were screaming, who are you to tell us whether, who we should elect for president? And the whole Nazi syndrome just gave, it was rebirth. It was a dangerous little thing. Why were the Jews against it? He, the guy was, oh, he was hiding his past. See, Waldheim was hiding his Nazi past. During the war, 
he was the uh, he was the, he was he was the head of the transportation department for the Nazis in Greece, which sent sixty thousand Jews to Auschwitz. It was kept quiet. The the Austrians, on the other hand, did not want the Jews to uh, tell them how to run their business, and this could have. And slowly you could see the rise, the hate of the Austrians come back again. There was a, a resurgence. They were back again. They're here. I used to write for the Jewish press. I didn't write about politics. I wrote about wine, but this was a very interesting thing, which was of interest to the Jewish population in general. And I wanted to find out a little more about it. I got an appointment through Rabbi Biederman with Simon Wiesenthal, the known Nazi hunter. Very special person. One of the most phenomenal people I've ever met in my life. This man is Simon Wiesenthal, and he has experienced firsthand what hatred can do to people. He and his wife were incarcerated in Nazi concentration camps and separated. 89 members of both their families met with death at the hands of the Nazis, but Mr. Wiesenthal somehow managed to survive. When I was liberated by the Americans, there was no one person at that time that I knew had not known that my wife survived, for whom and with whom I should live. And then I saw all my uh, comrades and immediately I feel that we not only have loose people, have loose properties, houses, uh, money and so on. We lose every believing in humanity, in friendship and in justice. Who was financing him? The Viennese government, the Austrian government. Why? Because they wanted, they wanted people not to, to forget their peace, their role during the, during the war. So they covered it up by giving, by giving Wiesenthal everything he wanted. And when I say everything, they underwrote his whole deal to keep, the, you know, keep themselves out of the limelight. So I asked, I went to Wiesenthal and I asked him what he thinks about all this. And he said that as far as catching Nazis, this one Nazi, uh, Walton Waldheim, he has. He knows exactly where he is. What's everybody going after them for? The Jews should not, they would be, by the Jews doing what they're doing, going against them openly, they're destroying something. They're destroying everything that he has built up his position as being, they helped him find other Nazis as long as he wasn't finding them in Vienna and Austria. We had to find a way how to politically maneuver this and get the Jews off Austria's case, for the, for the moment anyway. And I spent two days with him, with, with Wiesenthal. I found him to be one of the most phenomenal people that I've ever met. You know, he was a guy that was in every concentration camp. He was brilliant. He was humble. He, he meant what he, he, he did what he, he was only successful. His success was because he was devoted to get, not to let this, not that we shall never forget. And after spending two days, we've, yeah, we figured out how to, what to write, what we shouldn't write, how to continue pursuing this. And before I left to New York, which was on Thursday night, I was in his office. I mentioned to him, Herr Wiesenthal, you know I'm a Lubavitcher. And he, did, he, he had mentioned to me a number of times of how he admired the Lubavitcher Rebbe and his respect to the Rebbe. So I told him, I wasn't sent here to put on film with you or anything of this sort. I, I did this on my own 
because of the newspaper. But nevertheless, I'm going to be in New York the next day. Let me make the Rebbe happy. The Rebbe is happy. <laughs> Not the Jew puts on film, you know. At that point, he looked at me and asked, do I have to put him on in front of you? So I told him, you don't have to put him on at all. This is a request. Do as you please. So he says, okay. He took my phone and he went into the other room. At that point, I knew I was going to miss my flight. Or I thought I was going to miss my flight. And he's in the room for two hours. He spent with my toe. What he did in that room, I don't know. But when he came out of the room, one set of film was seemed that they had been take, taken apart and they were taken out of the boxes. And he seemed to be very, very emotional. I didn't ask him, did you put on film? I, I said nothing. <laughs> I kept that, I didn't even touch that topic. And he says, don't worry about your flight. I know you have a flight. I'll arrange for you to get home. I'll arrange for you to have a flight back to the United States tonight, which he did. It was no problem for him to get flights anywhere at any time to any make it. The next day when I came back to New York, I wrote everything into the Rebbe. That I just came back because the Rebbe sent me to Vienna to give uh, beat him in his uh, uh, regards and the, mo and the monies. And I also happened to have met Wiesenthal. And uh, short, I asked Wiesenthal to put on till, and I don't know whether he did or he didn't. Mm -hmm. That was it. Very shortly afterwards, I got a note back from the Rebbe thanking me for what I did.